Well, welcome everyone to another Talks at Google event. We're very, very pleased to welcome to the Bay Area, Adam Shankman. <laughs> I, see, I see you've got the horn sign down now. Oh, yep. yeah. <laughs> Um, so Adam, I, yeah, I've got to get this list. I've got to read from my notes here. So Adam is a director, a producer, a dancer, an actor, and a choreographer. And we'll hopefully touch on each one of those, uh, this, the history of his career uh, in this interview. And he's also been a judge and is continuing to be a judge on a TV I only, show. I only judge for money. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, um, totally judgment free. Totally judgment free? <laughs> totally. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Um, on So You Think You Can Dance, and he's produced the 82nd Academy Awards, which in, you know, in and of itself is just a, a you know. That a, was the Steve complex. Martin Alec Baldwin one, the good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's also directed television, so episodes of Glee and Modern Family, and as well as several films I'm sure you're familiar with, um, things like Hairspray, The Wedding Planner, Bringing Down the House, and most recently he's just finished up on Rock of Ages. So I think we're going to quickly cut to a trailer for Rock of Ages. birth to some of rock's greatest anthems. What's it like to be the Stacy Jacks? Stacy, you made it. Hey, man. Hey, man. No, this is hey, man. Hey, man. <laughs> when I was a kid, I wanted to be Stacy Jacks. You're a singer. And you have real talent. That stage is a pedestal. When you're up there, you're untouchable. This club is totally out of control. Our whole existence is riding on Stacy Jacks. We're gonna shut them down. Oh my god, I just threw up. Where? In my pants. Oh. You want love? Go after it. I can guarantee you something more cool. Fame. If you wanna get respect, you got to take that stage. until it hurts. I was amazed at how quiet that trailer was. Yeah. <laughs> Very low key. So what attracted you to the material at first when you Rock of Ages? I mean, did you have long hair in 1997? Well, and oh, God, I had horrible, I had horrible Jufro. <laughs> and, um, and then I got home from high school one day and um, a f <laughs> took a watermelon <laughs> and filled it with vodka. And some friends of mine we'll that's out on a Wednesday after high school. And um, I hope my parents are watching this. And, um, and th then we decided what a great idea. We were going to cut my hair. And they, I, I used to refer to it as the Ellie Mae. Because what they did is they had a, it had a giant curly top. And then it was like sort of shaved. And actually, she actually went to the scalp at one point around here. And then it was just like long and curly back here. <laughs> So I. You're still friends with these people. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, one of them is now the president of NBC. <laughs> um, she is Jennifer Sulky. Is actually was actually the person. Um, and um, I wonder if that's on a resume. Yeah. Um, hi, Jen. 
Um, but we are, but yeah, I, I mean, I grew up, my dad was in the music business, and I grew up um, uh, literally on the corner. His office was at 9200 Sunset, which is like Doheny. And it's the beginning of the strip. And I was, I, my first concert that I went to when I was 12 years old was at the Roxy, but it was the Cramps. And the lead singer pleasured himself and finished on stage <laughs> at the concert. And I, was, and I was like, wow, music is weird, you know? Um, he fulfilled his contract. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but, like, uh, but then, you know, I was a huge Foreigner fan and a huge Journey fan. And, and I started going to, my first concert would actually, was actually David Bowie at an arena. Um, but anyway, so this was kind of my time. And, um, and what I remember about this time was that it was sort of the last period of our innocence kind of around because the, these people were running amok like children and there seemed to be no consequences for anything. You know, you would just throw a couch out of a hotel window and it was like, yeah, you know. And like when people, you could have casual sex and there was no AIDS and you would, you never heard the word rehab, you know, and, and they were just doing mountains of drugs, you know, but it was just all in fun. I remember there's a brilliant documentary called The Decline of Western Civilization, The Metal Years that I literally stole everything from this movie from. And um, there is an interview with Paul Stanley from Kiss and it starts tight and he's clearly like under a sheet and it's, he's talking just about life and rock and roll. And then it pops out wide, and he's literally in bed with four girls who are also naked. And, and that's how he just did his interview. And that was normal. So I, I thought, OK, I, I totally get this. So um, me personally, I, you know, this was more, this music was like the, really the wallpaper of my life. Because it, and back when MTV actually played music videos, Every one of these things was on every second. So whether or not you're listening to it on the radio or had all the, what would they have been now? Well, they would have been cassettes um, or had the cassette. Um, on your Walkman. Yeah, on your Walkman. Um, that, there was no way to avoid this music. So um, it's, it was so entrenched in my consciousness. And, and, and then when they asked me to do it and I went and saw the play, I, I was barely watching the play because I was freaked out about how out of their mind, the audience was just crazy for it. They were like practically eating their seats. Um, they were, and they were all straight in a Broadway musical, and they knew all the words. And I thought, I'll never know an experience like this again. This is like an unheard of moment. And so I thought, if I can combine all of my skills and get that kind of audience, it would be kind of an amazing experience. And was it one of the biggest challenges of actually working on this movie, just getting those songs out of your head? I mean, if you hear them oh, so yeah. many times, oh, God, it's like, well, every now, single one it, up there, you just... It, well, they're on the radio the now all the time. I mean, We're Not Gonna Take It is now like a hotel commercial, um, the theme song. And so, and it's a big <laughs> use it. It's a bit about being coffee, about we're not going to take bad coffee anymore. <laughs> I'm sure that's what the song was originally intended to be about. Um, they went back to the roots. Um, but, you know, the biggest challenge for me with this, uh, because it is a jukebox musical, and this is the nature of jukebox musicals, is that the songs are not written for a character. So you have to mold everything around those words coming out of people's mouths. I mean, in this movie, there's, there's, um, there's the, the production, there's the, the numbers that are presentational on stage, and then there's dialogue, and then there's monologues, and stuff going on in people's heads. So it was just a matter of find, putting the right words and keeping the everybody who they are and real, as real as you can be in this world. But by the way, this is a real world for me because I actually do sing and dance regularly in my life and am a true embarrassment at the gym. So where were you in 1987? 1987, I was in New York. Um, and I was more of like a club kid uh, back then. I was more, I was more new wavy, kind of. Um, but I, was, I got back to L.A. I'm from L.A. And I got back to L.A. Yeah, I, was, I, had, I had left school, and I was a waiter. And had just started doing, um, I started working in, in theater, musical theater. Because you went to Juilliard at 18, and. Yeah, yeah, and I dropped out soon after. But you actually got in without actually having. Having ever had a dance, dance class. class, I know. I was a weird one. I was flash dance. It was literally, it was like me and leg warmers, like <laughs> dancing. And 
I got, I had never taken a dance class and um, they let me in. And, and I got into every school that I auditioned for without ever having had, had a dance class, which all it means is I'm a good imitator. Do you know what I mean? It's like I knew where to put my leg at the right moment, whatever. But that was really crazy, that audition, because they have a very strict ballet bar and I didn't know what any of the words were. I kind of knew what a plie was, but at past that, I had never heard it. So I'm just like looking at everybody trying to just get past the audition. It was crazy. And but New York didn't really hold you in sway, but and you well, went back I, home for. Well, I uh, honestly, I had just done some uh, summer stock, and I had my first relationship, and I was, and it ended really weirdly. He kind of flipped out, and so I moved. But my parents said, just please come back home, and I. I, I moved back to LA. This was my dream to become a music video producer. And then I ended up working at a restaurant and um, then got in, I auditioned for and got in the Janet Jackson Escapade video. So I'm in that. And then I got in, and then I did the American Music Awards for her, same thing. And then I got in the Oscars that year, which was the year Paul Abdul choreographed it. Yes, I'm a Paul Abdul dancer. Um, and, um, Soon, th right thereafter, I kind of lied my way into my first choreography gig and kind of never looked back. I was very young. I was only 24 when I started choreographing, so. And having grown up, grown up in Hollywood, you probably had folks you knew or, or friends of parents who were in the movie business in some way, shape, or form. Well, you what? You never really thought about movies as such, more choreography. Well, I never wanted dancing. to be a director. Oh, God, I, that never even occurred to me. But what the choreography thing, what was really cool was I had all these friends um, who were part of a young um, Hollywood organization called Young Artists United. And um, my friend Patrick, who actually started Rock the Vote, um, uh, was ahead of this thing. And it was all people like Judd Nelson and Sarah Jessica Parker and Robert Downey, who I lived with when they were together. They were my roommates. Um, <laughs> And um, but we would go to this, all these school. They would go around to schools and preach like not doing drugs and drinking. <laughs> and then when they were actually was, doing research, yeah. And then, and and so what started happening with all these friends of mine is they they started to become movie stars and they started to ask for me on their movies. Um, they I was their friend who was the choreographer, and so that was them flexing their new muscles. And so I, that's how I kind of started in the movie thing. But other, before then, it was a lot of music videos, tons and tons and tons of music videos. But your sister is a producer as well. Did she, you guys ever say, hey, when we grow up, we're going to no. dive in and we just never evolve? Said that. We, that. No, we, we were more saying, like, I hate you. No, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Um, we were, um, what, she is five years younger than me. And she was uh, working for a company. And she produced that movie, She's All That. And she asked me to choreograph. It, and there's like a big prom scene and then there's some other weird stuff in there that I had worked on and she thought I would she thought I was good and she thought I should be a director and I was like but I don't know what you're talking about and I was actually at that point I had honestly choreographed like 70 movies in the in like 10 or 11 years and a, a million TV shows and, and commercials and I was sort of getting a fatigue from directors that I found to be challenging that they couldn't make decisions and so I I pulled it together and I spent my own money and made a short film and the producer of that short film without asking me submitted to Sundance and it got in and the rest is history. <laughs> so it sounds like through osmosis just being exposed and on sets oh, all yeah. the kind of nuance or the, the different roles within I did not go to school for this. You just got exposed to it and took it on. So script Well the, the best part is that my you know my parents my mom's a shrink and my dad is a was a lawyer so my whole a, approach to actors is assess and negotiate. <laughs> and it's on a case-by-case -case basis. <laughs> and so it's worked for me. And as far as assess and negotiate um, with regards to just every component of the movie industry, because it's always, I think, from the outside, you he pick up on you know, different words as far as something being greenlit and, mm -hmm. pr and multiple producers versus an executive producer and all these different roles. And it seems just like, well, it's obviously hurting cats and it's extremely complex and difficult. But how did you get you know, comfortable in each of those roles? So for example, just getting to you know, how scripts work, how script you know, formats work, you know, act one, two, three, when certain types of events should happen. Uh, well, I'd been through so many, and I'd seen so many people go up, and I'd seen so many people come down. And one of the th and being a crew member, as a choreographer, I'm just a crew member, and, and knowing, 
and you really get to know. And, and by the way, as a choreographer, I am also directing the actors in the scenes. You know, I was hired to do a lot of scenes with the leads and the thing because you know scripts say, and then they dance, and then and so that's where I come in. So um, I had already worked a lot with actors. Um, I knew a lot of actors growing up. My dad represented a bunch, and um, and I I saw. I never learned anything from a good director. I literally never learned anything from a good director. I learned a lot from the bad ones. Um, because I was like, God, I never want to be that person. I never want to treat people that way. I never, you know, there's a long list of I never want. Um, and so, but the, the good ones are just magic. Like, you don't understand what's happening. They're just creating something kind of great. And um, when I, you know, when, when I started directing, I just kind of like, you just kind of go with your gut and you know, it's like, it's all like weird, it's just opportunities, you know? And I, and I never take it for granted that this is my job and that this is an opportunity and that this is a privilege and, and that these people are entrusting me with a bunch of money and the actors are trusting me with their careers. And I take it seriously and that I am not better than any of the, the project, the this, the actor, the, any of it. So really, again, in the assess and negotiate thing, what I learned very early on is choosing which swords you're going to fall on because there are so many battles that you wage. And some of them feel very personal and, and they're not, you know, but they feel like it. And um, certainly the more I've gone on, the more I get frustrated because I feel like I've proven myself literally over and over and over and over again in so many different areas. And, you know, but it is everybody's job to treat you without trust. You know, it feels like it. Like they're all really behind you until that moment. You know, yeah. and then it's just like a disaster. And and then and I I have a a tough side, um, and I get my eyes narrow, and I can once again. That's where the shrink and lawyer part comes in, which is really good, is because I go for everybody's like Achilles heel. I go right for what's going to hurt him the most. You know. Well. As you, you you shifted into different roles, oftentimes you actually were doing two roles. So you would choreograph yeah. and you would direct. Choreographing, directing, producing, it's all, you know, all part of it. And, and you, you can't really effectively, I mean, hair, let's put it this way. Hairspray was much easier because I had choreographed it for me because I was choreographing for camera. So when Rock of Ages, I had, uh, there was only five weeks of prep. And it was a much bigger movie, same budget as Hairspray. It was literally, they were like, you have to back into a number. And so I said, okay, and we, we did it. Um, but I hired uh, my, a very good colleague who I think is one of the greatest choreographers on earth right now is this woman, Mia Michaels, um, and she choreographed it. And ah, we have some Mia fans. Um, and, and then, you know, and she's more of like an artist type and wasn't used to working on like strict production schedules and I need this now and yada yada. And on top of which I was asking her to do stuff that was so like she had never done before, which were sex. She she does not sexualize anything, and I have all these strippers in the movie, boy band choreography, which was she was like I was like no, it actually needs to be the Roger Rabbit, like it needs to actually, like I want them to be like going like this. <laughs> and she was like, I, she was like, I don't know who I am anymore, and so she'd cry, and it was amazing, you know. And um, and um, so that so that was that. But so uh, but that was hard because, you know, I would come in to watch a rehearsal and I wouldn't be familiar with all the, the stuff right away. But you know that's what I do. So I, I was very quick to figure it out. But there were times when like we would be shooting and she hadn't finished the number, and so she was making it up as we were going along. And it was four o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, can you show me what's next? She's like, I'm not sure what's next. And I was like, can we figure it out? <laughs> you know. But oftentimes those can be the best moments for inspiration, right? When you've just kind of gone through the other yeah, side. Yeah, I, I mean, I listen, I'm an adrenaline junkie, so you know, I, I live for that stuff. And and actually in it's in the most dire, more, most horrible moments that I go the most calm. You know. So Well, back to being able to kind of preserve your energy so you can, you know, put your the, in the most in the right spots. I yeah. think when you start to take on producing, directing, mm -hmm. and choreographing, how much more time would that add to a to a movie in in, when, in your planning, or you're just, I, because you're on the set, you just you get know it done. What? I'm not really good at living in the world. I'm really good at living on set, and so I'm just happy there. And so it's all good. Do you know what I mean? I I would love to say it's like oh, it's so grueling. It's so that 
it's not. I love it so much. Uh, it's, it's so much a better place for me than like me running amok in the world. Bad, 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 bad. Um, so, um, you know, I, 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 like I just started writing my first screenplay, which I was very excited about that I actually had the nerve to like think that I could look at a blank page and have something to say. Um, I, I'm imagining it's going to be horrible, but I'm excited. Um, and like I'm, I'm talking old. about writing, right. I'm writing um, a, a children's book series potentially. So and so I've started in addition that. to the screenplay. So then you're also yeah. Well, that for some reason is is much easier for me. I don't know why. I don't know why. Children's. Do you books. know why? I come like my a lot of my background is children's theater, so I'm very versed in that. So, and it's weird because I'm like kind of like a dirty old man. So, it's we it's weird. I mean, that, I mean, I'm not like <laughs> not really, but work, I'm but I'm like a person who's lived in the strippers. world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but the strippers in my movie are like Cirque du Soleil performers. They're like they're not strippers. They're professional pole specialists. <laughs> Now, trying to actually control that environment, because you're, you know, to your point, that time was so you know, drug, sex, and rock and roll, and obviously this is a, a look into that kind of window. Did, did some of that seep into the environment on the set, and you had to kind of keep that control, or oh, were you God, enthusiastic, no. like, oh, no, everybody no, was super no. professional? Everybody's super, I mean, you don't, when you're around Tom, there's just no room for any of that Tom Cruise. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yep, Tom. Um, um, you know, he sets a bar of professionalism that is so beyond anything you could possibly imagine. His, his enthusiasm, his energy, his there two hours before the crew, it's embarrassing because you're constantly, you know, trying to live up to that, that standard of professionalism and commitment. And that it's my whole thing. It's like, my life is too short and living on sets, they have to be happy sets or I'll kill people. Like, you're, you're happy or you're fired. It's basically my philosophy. So I, I, um, I, I insist that it be a, a, a fertile, happy environment. I mean, even when I was making A Walk to Remember, which is, and then she died of cancer movie, um, uh, I was a happy set, <laughs> you know? Well, I think that must help in an ensemble cast. I mean, that's quite a cast. It's Paul Giamatti, it's Mary J. Blige, it's Tom, it's Alec Baldwin. Everybody, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's And everybody at a different level of something and definitely big personalities. And um, But, you know, in a musical, because it, it's none of their forte except for Catherine, um, that Catherine Zeta, Catherine. <laughs> Um, other than Catherine, Catherine Zeta Jones, because they were out of their comfort zone, everybody was really into it and really incredibly, you, you know, it's a hard thing. You have to really rehearse. I mean, Tom Cruise literally willed a totally different person onto himself. His, the way he walks, the way he's singing. He was singing four or five hours a day for, for that many months. And I, I got scared he was going to blow out his voice. And, um, but it's insane. I mean, it's amazing the product that comes out of that, you know, for this, for this, just this movie's just like a party. But the work that went into it was incredible. And as far as discovering what you're going to do next, is, is your personal screenplay kind of top of the list? Or no, God, no, getting... no, 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 no. That piece of crap is never going to see the light of day. Um, <laughs> it's no, 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 it's very, very cathartic. And a lot of it actually has to do with dealing with kind of my demons from when I was first coming out. Um, and so, like, what could be more boring than that, you know? So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm in there um, doing that. But my next movie is a movie called This Is Where I Leave You. It's based on a Jonathan Tropper novel of the same title. Um, and what? Yeah, Zach is, yeah, Zach's doing it. Uh, yeah. Zach. So, oh, Zach. <laughs> um, yes. Um, Jason Bateman, Zac Efron, Leslie Mann, uh, I think Sudeikis, Malin Ackerman, Goldie Hawn, after 10 years, I got Goldie um, playing the mom, wow. who's basically playing my mother, which is going to be fantastic. <laughs> um, and uh, she's a character who's just, rich, or many, many years, she was like the Erica Zhang of, of, of parenting the books. Like she was, this, the, she was like the Dr. Spock, but like hot. 
And in writing her book, she basically revealed all the secrets of her family so her kids all hate her. But she's going on a book tour and the father just died and she's just gotten a giant boob job and she keeps trying to show her boobs to the kids like well, during their father's funeral. And, and, and it's, it, I cannot wait to get her out there doing that. This is gonna be so cool, I'm so excited. Um, but yeah, more, more casting announcements to come. And then after that, I'm supposed to do a giant green screen action adventure version of The Nutcracker. Because I don't want to take on the dancing version because I'm not George Balanchine and that's too scary. Um, so it's more like in the Alice in Wonderland, Snow White and the Huntsman vein of Nutcracker. But like, yeah, I mean, I went from that this rock of ages of people like crazy singing and dancing to literally a movie about people sitting in chairs, talking. And how does it go about actually keeping in touch with the projects as they're evolving to then finally say, okay, I'm going to be attached to this and this is actually happening. Because oftentimes you hear this stuff. Yeah. It's almost there, it's almost there. Oh, it's not, and then it's back. And and how do you- Oh, I've had lots of movies fall apart. Um, I've had lots of, I mean, a couple of my movies that I made happened simply because other ones fell apart. And then they kind of slid one in, like, because I just wanted to work. And because for me, it's it's perpetual school. I get paid to learn about how to keep doing this. And, um, you know, there's reasons why names like Cheaper by the Dozen 2 are on my resume. You know, that, that a little, uh, I was supposed to direct Four Christmases and that fell apart at Disney. And then, uh, and they literally were like, they were like, oh, we've got this great family comedy and it's, and there's a spy and it's good and we're gonna pay a lot of money. Um, uh, they're, they're, and then, they're, by the way, it's Vin Diesel. And I was like, what are you talking about? I, what do you mean I'm making a Vin Diesel family comedy? And it, it was the, it was the by the way, after you signed something? Uh, well, the president of, this is weird, the president of Disney at the time was this brilliant woman named Nina Jacobson, who I actually, we went to the same high school, and she just produced Hunger Games. And uh, she was just like, yeah, you're going to make this movie for me. And my deal was there. My, me and my sister had a, had a deal at Disney at the time. And I was like, oh my God, I'm making a Vin Diesel family comedy. <laughs> How much are you gonna pay me? You know what I mean? It was, so, but it ended up being an in incredibly fun experience, that movie. That movie sort of is still, uh, oh, I can live with that one. And is it usually the construct now is to get a director attached to something first to get momentum after? It's, it's all different ways. There's directors, there are actor attachments sometimes before directors. and Because, you know, now actors all have deals and they're all producers and it's like, you know, and managers are producers and it's, it's, it's all very, it, it, there's no one way it works. And then coming from an engineering company or at least personally, sometimes you wonder about all the great movies that Hollywood makes and all the not so great movies, and is there a way to engineer it so you can somehow produce more great ones mm, and less bad Not ones? really. Um, I mean, I haven't run a studio, so I don't know exactly how the notions of quota and all of that, or, or how that sort of happens, but you can just hope for good scripts. You know, I mean, I've basically, up until Hairspray, Everything that I had done had at one time been considered a very broken piece of material, and I had to go in and kind of, I was the fixer. And then Hairspray was great, and then I, then there was another one. And then, um, and, and this was, Rock of Ages was pretty funky because uh, some of the construct of the play, it, had, it was very breaking fourth wall, it was all narration, it was um, high camp, it was, and it was stuff that I was like, well, to emotionally get the, the audience invested, I'm gonna have to, Tweak the character. Yeah, it, yeah, do do a little magic, and um, but this one that I'm about to do is just an incredible piece of material. So I'm, I feel super lucky, like really lucky, like really really lucky. So um, like you don't get it how lucky I am. Um, <laughs> like I'm going to talk to you really for a long time about how lucky I am right now. Um, no, but uh, yeah, but there, the, you know, uh, quality control. Hollywood's never been known for that. You know, we're we're that's not our game. You know, that we leave that to the Weinstein Company. Um, no, we're, you know, we just, we cross our fingers and, and really hope for the best. Let's put it this way, you know this. Nobody goes out trying to do shitty work. Yep. You know, so, and, and these things are very difficult and they're labors of love and, and one, you, it is a year of your life and you can just find your life just passing you by if you're making one after the other. So it's just like, um, it's, there's a lot of, trying to be conscientious about what it is that you're doing. Okay, how great is this? I had 
um, an assistant that quit because, and he came up to me and said, well, I got this opportunity to direct a movie. I was like, Matthew, that is fantastic. What is it? He said, murder on cheerleader island. <laughs> was that two or that four? That is not a joke. That was actually the name of the project. And I said, don't tell me. It's about a series of murders on an island during cheerleading camp. He's like, yeah. And I was like, wow. I think you should take the opportunity. You know, and because everybody just wants to direct, you know, they think, they, and I was like, but why do you want to direct if it's going to be just like murder on cheerleader island? I mean, I get it, but really, you know. I think we can start taking some um, questions from the audience if, if anybody wants to hop I'm up. I'm very on shy, so. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's not going to ask you a question, he's going to the bathroom. <laughs> awesome. Can you just jump over the mic so we can catch it on yeah. DC? I went and saw Rock of Ages last night. It was wonderful. Oh, God. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful, wonderful show. Thank you. Um, I always get very nervous. I went and saw it, and... My, wa uh, <laughs> my wife and I had a great time, so thank you very much. Ah, um, straight guy. Seeing straight guy, sorry. Loving it. Yeah! Which kind of which leads into my questions, because I have, I have two sons. Well, actually, I have four sons. Um, how do you not know how many sons you have? <laughs> well, it's I only about, it's only about the, back the two you. oldest that I wanted to mention. They're, they're, uh, they're seven and six, and we have a... We have a, a tradition of watching musicals all the time. And um, so my question for you is, doing so many different mu musicals, you've had the Rock of Ages project and, and Hairspray and, and the Nutcracker one, which I'm very excited to hear about. What is the role, you know, my boys really enjoy uh, the classic Rodgers and Hammerstein sort of stuff or even the West Side uh -oh. Story kind of stuff. <laughs> do those, do those, types of musicals exist or could they still exist in this world, like new material? Can those things be rebooted in your in Rebooted your as films? Rebooted as anything. Is, uh, to, to, I mean, there to, are, they, to they, expose they, they new material, updated material to a younger generation. Yeah, that, I mean, they are endless. They're perennial on Broadway. I mean, you know, there's a constantly a, a new, you know, they just had a really successful run of like South Pacific and all of that. So it's, um, I, I, they exist there. Making them now, I think, where they would exist best and most is probably a cable now because I don't think the studios want to... I mean, you know, they're making another A Star is Born. Um, uh, Clint Eastwood is actually directing it, which is fascinating. Um I don't know. I mean, there's always, there's always, you know, people coming up like, let's redo MAME. And I'm like, really? We're, we're really, really redoing MAME? Okay, well. Um, you know, and they were doing them on TV for a while. They did Annie and Craig Zane and Neil Marin, the producers uh, who actually were on Hairspray, you know, had a real nice run of those. Um, but, you know, what audiences have a tough time, what studios have a tough time with is financing something that you don't feel a big audience for. Um, and, you know, it's safer to do something like on TV. Um, you know, something like A Sound of Music. Well, first of all, why would you want to remake something that is so brilliant? And, like, you know, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want... People are always asking me, to like, hey, why don't we redo West Side Story? And I'm like, why don't you go kill yourself? I want to have no interest <laughs> in doing that. Um, but, um, so, I mean, I can't really... The answer is kind of no in terms of movie. I, they are trying to do a remake, and they have been for a while, of My Fair Lady. Um, that's coming down the pike. I think Kira Knightley is who I heard. Is that right, Bebe? Yeah. Um, and maybe I should clarify that maybe it's not so much a reboot, but what if it's things that are in the same type of genre or, I guess, the same... Uh, you know, you know honestly, point, Rock of Ages, I can't take my seven and six year old to. And it will be probably 10 years before you I can, feel You can't, you just have to take them out for popcorn when Malin is seven having sex with times. her on, <laughs> on the air hockey table. They'll be so full of popcorn, they're not going to make it home. Yeah. But, but uh, the. Uh, oh, you should say, yeah, yeah, wait till the, you see the extended version, what I had to cut out. Hey. Um, <laughs> my, my assistant called it the extensed did version. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, listen, hairspray. Great for families. I mean, that movie did more for me with kids than anything in the world. It would, that was that was a huge deal for me because it also opened up parent children, uh, uh, parent and uh, child conversations about um, racism, 
bullying. Why didn't they want Tracy? Why? Because that wasn't a, you know, I mean, look at the center of that story is a movie about a, a, a fat girl who ends racism. How do you hate that movie? You know what I mean? It's like, and, and get Zac Efron. You know, so, you know, um, that one was kind of easy. But you know, I, you know what, my godson, who's two and a half, um, if I can get him away from the backyardigans. You know, he loves musicals. He loves all the old MGM musicals. He loves, uh, and those are just, those last forever. So, you know, the new ones, I mean, this one is, is, was sexy on purpose, you know, but it's inherent to the world. But, you know, it's, more getting made. More gonna get made. I have uh, three somewhat related questions about Tom. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> So why Tom Cruise for the role of Stacey? Because I want because he was a he in Surrey who basically rules that household <laughs> was a huge hairspray fan and they watched it probably three hundred times apparently, and um, and I met him at a party at a actually a one year old's birthday party literally sitting in one of those little baby chairs <laughs> and he pulled up one next to me and started talking to me and I was like he was like hey I'm Tom Cruise and I was like I know who you are <laughs> like why am I in a baby chair to meeting Tom Cruise now um and um, I actually stood up and it stuck to my ass <laughs> and this is not a joke that is a very true story um, it made him laugh. But he had, he made some reference to wanting to do a musical, and I was like, oh, that's great, and that will never happen, you know? And then this came along, and I thought, God, if I could get the biggest movie star in the world to play the biggest rock star in the world, that would be kind of an event. And I certainly don't want to put out a musical, put my name on something that's a musical that's my home, what I love the most, and not have people want to see it. Do you know what I mean? So I, I knew... It, it seemed stunty, but it's still the it what if. But by the way, I don't, how many people here saw it? Dude pulled it off, right? Yeah. I mean, like that 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 was that was a lot of work that went into that, and it was a gamble that paid off. So, kind of a follow up: How difficult was it for him to get into that role, and what did he have to do? We poured over. I, I sent him every book known to mankind of, about the, those guys in this period, and I talked to him endlessly about channeling his intensity into being intensely lost. Um, <laughs> I wanted him just to like not be a creature of the world who nobody <laughs> says no to, and um, who, you know, certainly Tom is not a stranger to the notion of being a star. So that was an easy in for him, but he, you know, the guy doesn't drink, he doesn't, uh, to my knowledge, he never touched a drug, you know, so this is all very foreign. Um, but he, lo it just made him laugh. The whole thing just, he thought it was so weird that I was asking him to do a musical and he just loved the opportunity and especially being a father and Suri being this incredibly creative, beautiful child, he loved having music in the house a lot. So it really, it did a lot in, in their family life. I, I'm, I'm poor Katie has to listen to that guy sing now every, <laughs> every minute of the day, but you know, and the dude has the loudest voice on the planet. <laughs> Decibel breaking. You, you touched on uh, this just a little bit, but just in general, what's it like to work with him? It was the greatest experience of my life. It was, it was, absolutely life-changing just in terms of having to look at myself and just say how present am I you know and how and 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 just really see there's zero ego there is just the work and that is so inspiring that is so inspiring there's been a few actors that I've worked with that have really taught me a lot Michelle Pfeiffer was one of them Michelle <laughs> Um, on and on, you know, I've, I've had the great pleasure of working with people who really take what they do seriously and I take what I do seriously because it's all I do, you know, I mean, this is, this is amazing. I can't believe like I'm out of my editing room or something like that. It's like, oh wow, there's people, you know, so it's, it's, it's great. It was an, it was amazing. He is as, you know, what's really funny about him when I look back now and think about like the Oprah thing and any of that stuff. That's real, like he gets that excited. He's like a kid, you know? He just, he's sort of guileless and, and just, he just loves stuff, you know? And that's real. And so it's, you know, sometimes I was like, you have to stop liking this movie so much. 
you know, please, you're killing me, dude. Um, but he, he just never wanted it to end. So. Uh, hi. I, uh, uh, first, my wife and I saw the movie last night. We loved it. It was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Oh. Um, and this, this question may be a little bit too close to work for most people, but uh, I'm a product manager in the ads group. I work on tracking how online advertising affects people's activities in the real world. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you can tell us about anything you're doing or that you know people in Hollywood are doing with regards to integrating the internet into movies and Oh my God, it's a huge part of our discussions during the marketing of a movie. You know, um, they're, they're now, they're now partially predicting openings by Twitter activity, um, trending, um, certainly, you know, an active Facebook page, uh, anything that's interactive with a greater audience, it's, it's a big part of our discussions. Do you do anything with things that are more than just tracking ads, but also like live interaction? Aren't I doing it right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you a specific example. Yeah. In New York, there's a there's a group called um, Punch Drunk, uh -huh. and they they do this live interactive theater example um, experience, and uh, they're they're working on some things where you know you kind of integrate the the live experience with the um, the sort of internet experience so that there's something happening simultaneously. And there are other people who have done things with like voting systems and things like that. Is there anything experimental you know of or anything that? Uh, um uh, you know, I, I just the, I don't know about it, but I'm sure there is. I, I'm a guy who I, uh, a young director who I gave his first job. Uh, he did the second, he did the second and third Step Up movies, John Chu, and he just did GI Joe. YouTube just gave him a whole channel, right. and that's all about dance stuff material and i know he's doing lots of different kinds of work like that but he's really techy and really into it and if anybody knows about it it's him he's actually he's kind of he's he's a pusher on that one okay thank you and i think that concept of 360 degree media is really taking hold because both in television so a lot of you know i know you've directed glee and modern family and a lot of those experiences for like heroes they existed outside of the the film so you actually go to the website or you go and experience something that's part of the storyline that's actually not yeah. just in the, in television or... I think can, that's fantastic. And you can look into the journey of a film more and more because you can give updates from the set and really for people, for fans to just participate more, it's so much easier. Yeah, I, I was... During the whole making of the movie, I was doing that, you know, I was trying to keep it as alive as possible, well, tweeting a lot of pictures, doing as much as I could. We didn't do any... Um, we didn't do any um, live streamy stuff because out of context, this movie could feel weird you know what i mean it looks a little odd i mean i think that audiences for this movie aren't exactly going to know what they're in for when they go in because it is an unusual hybrid of a movie um and it's hard to kind of express the tone of the movie in the advertising you know what i'm saying kind of weird like you don't really it, like i'm just assuming from your reaction that it was better than you thought it was going to be so <laughs> Which I'm happy to take, by the way. So that is, that's all good. And that just, that, that creates word of mouth. I'd rather have a low expectation with a high result, you know? Well, I think because this has such a frame of reference that everybody, you know, you hear those songs and you automatically kind of remember and associate with those. And that, so they bring both good stuff and possible baggage. So yeah, I think that's yeah. a good. good I mean, the same with, uh, you know, cast members. Hi, thanks for coming, by the way. My um, pleasure. Yeah. I'm loving this, by the way. This is fun <laughs> for me comment the school prom choreography and she's all that was like the best thing that ever happened to me in sixth grade so it was awesome <laughs> that was me <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> i love it i love it <laughs> yeah yep yep i had about two hours to put that whole thing together and wow. i'm not kidding that was actually they they literally brought in the dancers i taught them it in two hours in the lobby of, it was the Cerritos Auto Square where we shot that wow. <laughs> in like Long Beach. And uh, the next day we were literally mm -hmm. shooting it all day. Uh, it, it was the craziest thing. I just like, okay, Skill. Hollywood. It's good times. Yeah. But um, my question is Nicholas, <laughs> Nicholas Sparks came a few weeks ago um, promoting The Lucky One. Uh -huh. And I know he wrote A Walk to Remember. Yeah, I was last song. I've yeah, done two of them. Definitely. So I was wondering what's the dynamics between working with authors and movies that are adapted from novels? Like, what's that dynamic with working with those authors as a director? And well, I can like only that. speak to mine, yeah, uh, to my experiences, exactly. which sure. is during Walk to Remember. It, that was I was 
very, very, it was very precarious because I was changing the whole time period of the movie and it was about his sister. Mm-hmm. So I was very nervous about how he was going to react. Because it was originally set in the 40s. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so what I made sure that I did, and I did this actually with John Waters in the Hairspray, and I'm doing it right now with Jonathan Tropper on This Is Where I Leave You. I, I have unending conversations with them where I really keep them in the loop and they feel really appreciated and part of the process. And, the, and I don't make any dramatic move without talking to them. And it's not like what they say is going to influence me a lot because I have the story as I see it in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, and once again, that's the only frame of reference I can do it from. If I try to live in somebody else's box, I, it's a, it, it just won't work. So, um, so I, I just kept Nick really close. I kept, and then last song, I don't know if you know the lore behind this, but this was crazy, and this is <laughs> the, this is so pure Nick. That, Nick. <laughs> um, that um, my, uh, we got a call from Disney saying, Miley Cyrus, her favorite movie is Walk to Remember, and she wants to do a movie like that. Do you have anything? Can you come up with something? And my sister said, let me think. And she literally had the nerve. She called Nicholas Sparks, um, and he took her call. <laughs> and um, she said, do you have anything you can dust off, you know, anything in your drawer? that my, He's like, no, but I've been thinking that I, my next book should be for young audiences again. Mm-hmm. So let me think about this. And he called her back the next day, and he said, I have it. Here's what it is, and I'm going to write the book and the script at the same time. Nice, wow. And I'm writing it for her. And I'll release the book right in time for it to precede the opening of the movie. Wow. And that's how that happened. And it literally just happened. And I was like, that it was crazy. Literally the book, Last Song, was written Four. to make sure that Miley Cyrus had a movie version of it to be in. Wow. Yeah, Hollywood. <laughs> Scary. Wow, cool. So, um, but, I, but my thing is just to keep them there and and I've been very successful in terms of my relationships with the authors as a result of keeping of keep being very very respectful. John Waters sent me after he saw his hairspray sent me the the best email of my life. He was driving back on the Acela train um, from New York. He was going back to Baltimore and he just wrote just saw the movie you've made me the proudest grandfather on earth. Aww. Love John. And I was like I'm so happy. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Thank I'll just be shorter in my <laughs> answers, sorry. Um, do you have any examples or anecdotes about the adversity you face being a untrained dancer in choreography and bursting into that world? The adversity of it? Yeah, like were you, did you receive any backlash from? Oh, oh God, yeah, I was, I was treated really badly by the, um, I, was treated, I was treated well by choreographers, I was treated very badly by the teachers because I just had no training, and, but they treated me because I was embarrassed to tell them that. They treated me like I had like 13 years of terrible, terrible training that they had to undo. But I didn't want to expose the fact that I had no training because then it could have created a fuffle in that world. Like, how did they let me in? And, Mm -hmm. you know, all this stuff. And the Juilliard philosophy is to uh, break you down and create the best technician possible so that you're technically prepared. So, uh, yeah, I I got beat up a lot. I got beat up by the teachers a lot. That was hard. That was hard. It was psychologically and emotionally very hard for me. I'm still clearly damaged, you can tell. (laughs) She made it. Thank you. Great. Well, on behalf of Google, thanks, everybody, for coming.